the speaker. It gives me enormous pleasure and an enormous amount of pride to introduce Julia Payton Jones, the director of the Serpentine Gallery UK, who will be enthralling us with her own take on what she's done with the Serpentine and how she's managed to grow it from a domestic size small space into the powerhouse that it is now internationally. Thank you, Julia. Thank you. Firstly, indeed. Firstly, I cannot tell you how wonderful it is to be here, not, not only to be in the region, of course, um, that almost goes without saying, but to be recognized that if you run a publicly funded institution, certainly in the UK, you are by very necessity an entrepreneur. And the reason you're an entrepreneur is because in, in Britain, there is still a legacy of public subsidy for the arts. But public subsidy for the arts, that means um, arts organization, whose uh, remit is to engage and educate the public, as opposed to commercial galleries, whose job is to present and sell the work they show. So we are firmly and resolutely on the side of educating and informing the public. And uh, like many other of our colleagues, we have um, a small amount of public subsidy from government in order to do that. But in these difficult and challenging economic times, that subsidy is dwindling uh, almost as we speak. There was a spending review by government last week, and there are going to be 15% cuts across the board, which may not sound much uh, for an organization our size, but for smaller organizations, it's very significant and could be the difference between staying open and closing. However, when I took over the Serpentine in 1991, uh, I embraced the idea that we would get some money from, pub from the public, but we would also need to raise money ourselves and predicated on that American model. The American model is there is almost no pub public subsidy and everything has to be generated from a wide variety of different income sources. We embraced that with enthusiasm and began what has been an absolutely fascinating uh, period that um, uh, had a marker in the sand last week because we announced the largest donation in our history, which would rank in the top 10 donations in the last 20 years uh, in the UK. So a very significant sum of money. But I'll go on to tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, our budget is 5.2 million. Of that, as I said, we get 18% from government and we raise the rest. And we do that through sponsorship, trust and foundation income, individual giving, philanthropy, in other words, uh, our, annual, um, our annual fundraising summer party, and other various marketing opportunities. We firmly um, believe in art for all. We are completely committed to art for every sector of society internationally. We have five strands of our program, exhibitions, architecture, the pavilion, our annual architecture commission, design, education, and public programs. Unlike other organizations, we operate a flat structure insofar as we do not privilege one strand of the program above any others. Although it would be true to say, if you took the exhibition program away for the Serpentine, it would be a very big problem. So it, although I say that, it, there is some kind of hierarchy, but the principle is that it's a virtuous circle. The artists that we have exhibited, uh, to give you some household names, range from Andy Warhol to Damien Hirst at the very beginning of his career. So the remit is very, very wide and purposefully wide because um, it is even true now that um, there are artists of great significance whose work has not been presented in the UK. Now, I have a time scale, but I want to tell you two stories. So I'm going to have to speed read the first in order to get on to the second. I want to give you the official version and the unofficial version. But I am a little bit worried about time, so I might try, I'll try my best to do both. Um, let me see if I can cut to the chase. I think I'm going to do the unofficial version first. Um, when I became director of the Serpentine Gallery, it was 1991. London had just come out of a recession. And there was a tiny community to see contemporary art. Um, really, there was no collector base to speak of, and it was a time which was a sort of 
enclosed, if I can put it like that. It was beginning, we were beginning to be international, but there was still very much an island mentality. And in relation to where London is now, and I have to talk about London, not only because it's where we are, but also because the arts are privileged in London uh, in a way that the rest of the country, while having the most astonishing museums, do not have the same sources of funding and the same public as we do in the, in the capital. Um, in the very early days, we did uh, exhibitions of uh, Damien Hirst, some of the great artists of all time, Robert Gober, for example. We collaborated with the Tate, with the Royal Academy, and very quickly, the Serpentine's reputation grew, not least because, concurrently, the idea of arts in the capital, arts in London, arts worldwide, also grew. But my challenge was how to transform a former tea room, which is this building here. It hasn't changed in architecture, in terms of facade, since it was built in 1934. The gallery is a 450 square meters, and I'm not sure what measurements you use here, but it's, they're really not so big. They're, it's a formal uh, space. There is nothing that you would associate with a museum now. In other words, there is a shop, but it's a dedicated bookshop for, for specialist books. It's not a bookshop that has mugs and pencils and T-shirts. We stopped printing postcards because we didn't sell enough. So it's really hardcore. When you come in, you get the artist that you come to see. It's unembellished. And that, of course, goes very much against the grain on how uh, art is presented now, which is, can be more like a kind of spectacle. Um, so my challenge was how to, how to turn this uh, former tea pavilion, where our chairman used to take his fox to tea with his nanny uh, post-Second World War, how to turn that into one of the premier spaces for contemporary art worldwide. We had absolutely no money. The Serpentine always says it has no money, but we had even less money then. And um, when I came, there were two slots in the first year of, of my directorship. One was um, uh, two months away, and one was three months away. I had 10,000 pounds to do the first show and 20,000 pounds to do another. And in fact, those two projects uh, were one of the most pioneering of the Serpentine Gallery's history. Um, the roof leaked terribly. And at the opening of exhibitions, we would literally put the pots and pans from the kitchen into the main galleries to catch the drips. Now, although I look back on it and think that that was very amusing, at the time, it was a source of immense embarrassment. We were showing uh, works of art that, had, that were museum loans by some of the greatest directors and curators in the world who we were working with. And they were unbelievably gracious and turned a blind eye to the fact that we did have this embarrassing situation. What it meant was that I was propelled to, um, to uh, start to raise money for a renovation of the Serpentine, which at the time, interestingly, when it was completed in 1998, was the same, cost the same amount of money that we now have to raise annually to present our programs. So the renovation cost 4.2 million for, to, to completely transform the building into a museum condition. In other words, so we could borrow works of art from any museum anywhere in the world. We could have the proper conditions in order to do so. To now, today, 4.2 million annually to, uh, to present the program that we do, the program that strands that I've told you. So it is an indication how very different the time was, as well as how much the Serpentine has grown. In those first early, early years, we also had a, a curveball that was totally unexpected. Uh, a man called Ian Sprout, who is the minister in the Conservative government, I heard from the editor of the Times who rang me and told me that he was going to, he had plans to turn the Serpentine Gallery, this little building here, into a riding school. Now, this sounds absolutely astonishingly extraordinary, and indeed, as an idea it was, but if the editor of the Times rings you, I can assure you, you take that very seriously. Um, I was told that Ian Sprott had not only said this once, but about three times, and as a result, the Times were going to have to publish. But they were very generously giving me um, a heads up, a heads up so that I could do something. Uh, and that was a very, very salutary lesson. It was a lesson that has stood me in immense good stead, because the lesson told me that um, uh, we actually didn't have many friends outside the art world. We had unbelievably distinguished friends inside the art world. And indeed, David Sylvester, curator, writer, 
broadcaster, um, a, a titan of his day, a specialist on uh, Francis Bacon, amongst many others, uh, wrote a letter to the Times in protest. But it was um, the art world, if I can put it like that, speaking to the art world. We didn't have titans of the community outside the art world who could come to our, or come to our cause, not come to our rescue, we didn't need rescuing exactly, but support our cause. So that taught me that it was very, very important to generate support outside our community and into a wider community. When we began to raise um, money for the renovation appeal, we had uh, one of the great figures of the 20th century, the Princess of Wales, who was our patron. Now, obviously, that was extremely helpful. It was extremely helpful for a number of different reasons. Obviously, what she stood for. And the fact that um, all those people who still in the early 90s, if you can believe it, found it perfectly acceptable to say, oh, if my child of uh, three could do this, what, tell me why it's art. Now, this is a most unbelievably boring discussion, and one I'm pleased to say that I haven't had for some time. But at that point, it was very, very usual. In addition to which, Picasso, who had, after all, been very long dead, there was still, amongst a certain group of people, quite a number of people, I must tell you, um, a question mark on Picasso's contribution to the 20th century. So you can see these times are very different to the times of today. The Princess of Wales was not only a dear friend to us, but she uh, was a champion of our cause. And it meant that she silenced immediately all those people who took such, um, who took such uh, critical view of contemporary art. Uh, because of her association with us, it meant that if they loved her, whatever she associated with must be acceptable. So that conversation was cut off at the knees, I'm pleased to say. She represented the Serpentine Gallery when she went to the Venice Biennale. And indeed, um, after three years, we saw off the, um, the idea that the Serpentine would be a riding school. Um, we renovated, we raised the money to renovate the Serpentine with extraordinary parties um, which she attended, uh, which were sponsored by Vanity Fair. And I'm sure all of you will know that Vanity Fair are really one of the greatest party givers of all times, one knows that from the Oscars. And so we were transformed, and I must tell you, the staff of the Serpentine at that point probably came to 12 people. And those 12 people had to do everything. So, I mean, you may be head of finance, but you also had to be a fundraiser, and you also had to be extremely good at knowing how to address people on the invitations because it was part of this idea of growing um, in a way that was completely organic. Uh, it was not a planned thing. I wish I could say that I came up with this unbelievable uh, five-year strategic plan and we ticked it off as we went along. It wasn't. It was much more organic than that. But what was interesting was that the need for what we needed to do provided the solutions as we went along. Um, the, the renovation was started in 1996 and throughout the whole period that I've been at the Serpentine, 19 years, the the privileging of art and culture, architecture, design, and education is the forefront of what we do. What we've, our challenge has been is how to support and enable what we do. In other words, find the solutions and find the, the resources to do it, not to change what we do to match the resource that we've identified. And that, of course, is an incredibly important and very, um, very pivotal thing. Once we'd renovated, another very important figure came into our lives in the form of uh, Mike Bloomberg, who, as you know, is now mayor of New York. And I was invited um, to a dinner party. Uh, it was a very um, un-English thing to do, whereby a public relations company wrote to me, for somebody I knew, and said, uh, Mike Bloomberg is going to be in ta town. He's CEO of Bloomberg, which was not really, he had no presence in London at the time. And he's written this book, perhaps you'd like to read it. Well, I thought, this is extraordinary. I don't have time to read a book about Mike Bloomberg. So I gave it to a colleague and said, please skim it. And she said, well, look, this is what I've discovered. But you know, it's all a bit mysterious to me. And at that point in the late 90s, there were no hedge funds. I mean, the, the, the idea of bankers were fine, but they were, they were sort of, they were, they were, they were scions of the, the financial establishment. The rather more entrepreneurial model really did not, uh, was not present in the way it is now. So I went to this dinner with Mike Bloomberg, and I was very lucky to be seated next to him. But the rather challenge that I faced was there was an unbelievably good-looking girl on his other side. 
And he found that unbelievably fascinating, not surprisingly. So I was faced with this completely humiliating idea that maybe I would have to go back to the Serpentine next morning. The person who'd read the book would say, how was it? My colleagues would say, you know, how was it? We were in the middle of the renovation in temporary offices. And you know, it was all hands on deck and one for all and all for one. I thought, I cannot let this be. So I tapped him on the shoulder and said, it's my turn now. <laughs> and he has a very good sense of humor. So he turned around and said, well, here I am. And I said, well, you know, what are you doing in London? So he said, oh, you know, I'm going to spend more time here. So oh, that's great. And um, he said, I'm going to have to give a speech. And I said, that's great too. And what are you going to say? He's going to say, oh, you know. He said, I'm going to spend more time in London. And you know, this is what we're going to do. And da, 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 da. So I said, that sounds very boring. And he said, yes, I know. And we giggled about how boring it was. And I said, well, I've got the solution. I know exactly how to do it. What you say to everybody is, um, you know, you do your speech. And then you say to them, um, and, um, and by the way, I've decided to give all my money to the Serpentine. So we collapsed in laughter. So it was the funniest, funniest thing. So he stood up at this dinner, which was a, a, a group of people in the arts world in a broader sense. And he did his speech, and he said, you know, I'm so pleased to be in London. I'm going to be spending more time here. And it's so great. And he did this fantastic the theatrical pause and said, and in case any of you are wondering, I decided to give all my money to the Serpentine. Well, <laughs> you can imagine. I whooped and hollered. Everybody else looked completely shell-shocked. And as a result of that, um, Mike joined the board, and he remains a friend of the gallery to this day. We gave a party for him recently uh, when he was in London. Um, and uh, Bloomberg's support of the arts are known, I think, worldwide. They are seminal in London. They have enabled such an astonishing range of things to happen. It's almost impossible. And... Um, and as a result of that, we are very, very, very fortunate of being really as a founder member of their sponsorship program. So then we had to come to terms with the fact that the Princess of Wales had by that time died. We were about to, we were about to, um, to open the, the, uh, the building, and we needed to do something completely and utterly different to what we'd done uh, when they were sponsoring us. And so for the same amount of money that I believed a tent, a marquee, a temporary tented structure would cost to erect in the park, which I believed was 100,000 uh, pounds, we commissioned Zaha Hadid, who, as you know, is the great Pritzker Prize winner, the only woman to have won the Pritzker Prize, but at the time an architect of immense distinction, but who had not built so much. And um, she joined the board, Peter Palumbo, our chairman, um, who is... Uh, is a specialist on architecture, hugely committed to it. And if you can collect buildings, well, he does. And so Zaha, um, I asked her if she designed this, this marquee for this, this gala dinner. And in the early 90s, because of the people who came to these fundraising parties, my belief was that probably they wouldn't know much about art. But that didn't matter. They were coming to the Serpentine, and it was our job to try and inform and educate them not only about what we do, but also what, what contemporary art could be. So we put on these three-day exhibitions uh, just for a weekend, which would encompass the Serpentine's program. It would show the artists that we'd exhibited to date over a very long history, um, a history that I was lucky enough to inherit. So they would range from Giacometti to Jasper Johns to some great British artists to artists who are young and emerging, um, Anish Kapoor and Paula Rego being two such examples. And um, those, those exhibitions we were used to putting on for two or three days. So why not put a pavilion on for a night? Now I'm going to try this magical trick and see if it works. No, it doesn't. <laughs> can I have some help, please? I'm sure I'm pointing in the wrong direction. Savita, can I pass this to you? Because um, like the magician and the rabbit, it's not happening, but it will soon. Um, so Zaha designed something which was absolutely extraordinary, because it was typical of our architecture. Um, yes, here we go. It was a tented structure, and she also designed the furniture that went inside it, and it was basically a symphony from white to black, with gradations of gray throughout the whole color range, um, so that it looked as though you were in an extraordinary, on looking at an extraordinary keyboard of the piano. Um, and this was sold to the Royal Shakespeare Company, not for a huge amount of money, but in the tens of thousands of pounds rather than the hundreds of pounds, where it then had a legacy and, it, um, and it, uh, it, it stayed up for, I think, two or three years. They used it as an entertaining um, uh, suite. But the important thing about 
doing this project was one, what it said about us, no tortured flowers, no table arrangements, resolutely contemporary, resolutely committed to architecture, um, resolutely committed to the greatest practitioners of the day, and of course, as she continues to be, um, and um, it used the tiny bit of ground that we had in front of the Serpentine Gallery, which is in the very heart of London in Kensington Gardens, uh, as another strand of our programs. The Royal Parks, in, who are our landlords, up until this point had been opposed is a rather brutal word, so let us say resistant, to us going outside our building. But because the Secretary of State for Culture, Media and Sport came to this evening, it meant that, and he liked it so much, he was very familiar with architecture, he knew, um, he knew, he knew about Zaha. Uh, he, he intervened with the Royal Parks, and so we could have it stay for the whole summer. Now, what developed, I need some more clicking, was a series of temporary structures every summer. I think we go the other way. Yes, um, not this one. No. <coughs> <laughs> Too many clicks. Um, so what happened was after this structure, yes, um, was we decided every summer, or we began actually in December, to commission an international architect who at the time of their invitation has not completed a building in London. Now that sounds a bit wordy, but the reason for that is it's a resolutely international project. It's about showing architects to a British audience uh, who may not have seen their work. Obviously, it's an international audience, but it's, the context is everything. It's, a, it's for an audience um, like an exhibition. So instead of seeing a, an exhibition of models, drawings, and photographs, we decided to commission uh, these great architects, who, as I explained the criteria, who'd not completed a building uh, in London, to design something that was symptomatic of their architecture that we would then build. So what we do every year is we embark on this fantastic program. We put them under immense pressure. We don't give ourselves any less pressure, I must tell you. Um, we have absolutely no budget for this whatsoever. And as it turns out, we, we are sort of a combination of property developers and estate agents, because we also sell this um, at the end of the summer. Uh, it never reaps more than 40% of its cost, but it is important because it's part of the financial plan and what we believe is that you don't need to be specialists to commission um, architecture. Indeed, we're not. We could, we're specialists in commissioning art, but not architecture. Uh, you don't need to be specialists um, in, um, in realizing projects of this kind. You don't need to have a lot of space, and you don't need to have any money. Now, uh, it is still the only scheme of its kind worldwide, and the Sarna Pavilion of 2009 the Pritzker Prize winners of last year, uh, the curators of the Venice Biennale this year, was the third best attended exhibition of architecture and design worldwide. So against, if you see, think on the one hand, 800,000 people a year, and this astonishing um, tribute, I, I feel deeply honored that we should, we should be ranking third. And if you remember the little building I showed you at the beginning, that is, I think, one of the things that is really fascinating, which is you don't, have, you don't need a lot to do more, if I can put it like that. Um, now, if we move forward, because I have to keep an eye on the time, um, one of the things that is really fascinating is how you get an organization to keep on growing within this tiny footprint. You push every aspect of your resources from your footprint to your to your team, to your contacts, to your thinking, to the absolute uh, furthest limit. Um, and if we can just whiz through, I should say the last pavilion was by Daniel Liebskind, who you may know from Ground Zero, who was commissioned to do Ground Zero. I'm sorry, Savita, you need to go back a bit so I can just run through the architect's names. Um, a bit back a bit. So this is Daniel Liebskind. The next one is Toyo Ito. Um, this is by Oscar Nima, who, of course, the architect of Brasilia, Brasilia, the great modernist of all time, who at 103, if we all need inspiration, uh, is, no, I'm sorry, he's 102, he'll be 103 in December. He, he completed and opened four buildings this year. Now, I can think of nothing more inspiring. 
And when I saw him in Rio de Janeiro um, uh, just recently, about a, a month ago, he, he spoke more English to me when I saw him than we did when we were working together. This is by Alvaro Cesar and Eduardo Soto de Mora. Then the next one is by Rem Koolhaas and Cecil Balmond. This is another project by Zaha Hadid. It's called Leila's, and she called it in Installation on Our Lawn. And it was only two weeks. It was up for two weeks because um, in each of these cases, our summer party that has continued since the early 90s, which continues to be an astonishing way of bringing people to the Serpentine Gallery who may or may not have any interest in art, who may or may not know about the Serpentine, but we give them a reason to feel comfortable uh, being in the, our environment. Because if you do something for the first time, you feel a bit uncertain, maybe. But if you bring people to a party, they might feel good about themselves. They might feel good about the people who give it. And they might go on to support, we hope, the Serpentine. But if not us, then other people. So I am very um, robust about any criticism that we might have about uh, how many parties we may or may not give. Because the one thing that every person um, who has been extraordinarily successful in their lives will have heard of is the summer party. And from that, they then continue to become more involved with us, more engaged, more knowledgeable, and so on. And a very quick aside, we have had members of the Council of the Serpentine Gallery, our largest giving donor group of over 50 people from 23 different countries, who start off with us walking in on the first day going, Julia, what is all this? to ending up being commissioning um, major films about China that is shown on Channel 4 television, which is one of our four principal networks, or starting an entrepreneurial organization uh, called Outset, which is the biggest funder, uh, well, the, the newest funder for the arts in the UK. So, I mean, from little oak trees, if I can put it like that, great, uh, little, what is the expression? Acorns. Acorns. Great oak trees grow. Um, one of the things that I've always been committed to is, of course, expanding our programs. And the way to do that is to be unbelievably knowledgeable about uh, art and culture worldwide. Um, and so my very old friend, Hans Ulrich Obrist, who is now co-director of exhibitions and programs and director of international projects, and I began to uh, a conversation about architecture, which started at the Courtauld Institute after he had given a lecture that went on for one year until I suggested that he come to join the Serpentine as, as co-director of exhibitions and programs with me. He is a resource beyond any other. He is also a very dear friend and a wonderful person. And what he's done is brought to the Serpentine Gallery a freshness of thinking um, as well as a, an entrepreneurial attitude that has meant that the programs have developed hugely. What we did in the, when we started out was to make a commitment to showing art, from, not from all centuries, but across the, the really basically post-Second World War, um, but also to embrace China, India, and the Middle East, and ongoing after that. We have completed two um, extraordinary exhibitions about China. The first took place at Battersea Power Station, the largest uh, brick building in Europe which compared to the Serpentine's uh, size, you couldn't get to two greater extremes. So on the one hand, Battersea Power Station. On the other hand, Indian Highway, which is a touring show that has um, it started with us at the Serpentine Gallery this time, but which is touring to Moscow, to Hong Kong, to Delhi, and to Denmark, to give you four examples out of, an, out of a, a range of different uh, cities that or places that, um, that amount to something like nine so far. And also we have a very ongoing, a very deep commitment to the Middle East with a research project that we, uh, we started two years ago uh, and a dedicated place off the Edgware Road um, called the Center for Possible Studies. So uh, artists from the Middle East come to this center that we run, we initiated and run, in order to work as a residency for three months and then continue on their way and come back again. And this um, will, within the next two years, result in an exhibition at the Serpentine Gallery itself. Uh, I am now almost out of time, but I want to tell you before I, I leave about, oh, let's just quickly finish. Um, this is Frank Geary, 
Uh, Olaf Eliasson was the, the, the brown wooden, almost like a spinning top. Olaf Eliasson and Kjertel Torsen. Um, Frank Geary, that is uh, Sana, who I explained was the third best attended exhibition um, of architecture. This is Jean Nouvel, which has just come down. And now, this is our new and latest project. What we did last week is announce two major gifts to Serpentine. One was from the Sackler, Mortimer and Teresa Sackler Foundation, who are the Rolls Royce, the king and queen of, of philanthropy anywhere in the world. There are two brothers that support the arts, uh, having made uh, their fortunes in medicine. And um, they gave to us the funding of great significance to take over this building for the next 20 years that we will run as the other half to the apple of the Serpentine Gallery. So the Serpentine Gallery's programs that I've described to you uh, broadly will continue as they are. What will happen in this uh, <coughs> building is um, our programs that embrace all art forms. They will embrace visual art, architecture, design, film, fashion, technology, dance, literature, and if I've left something out, then add it to the list. It'll be about discoveries, not about necessary youth, but about discoveries, people who are less well-known, people who are emerging because of their practice, but people can emerge um, at 80, I hope, as well as they can at 18 or 28. And um, one, of the, uh, one of the wonderful things is that not only will Zaha Hadid restore this building, which is a former munitions um, uh, repository uh, for arms and armaments, um, but she will also design a pavilion, a tented structure, so at long last the Serpentine will have a permanent cafe uh, next door to it, within five minutes' walk of the gallery. So in 2012, we will open this great space and uh, be the proud possessor of two buildings um, in Kensington Gardens rather than one, we will uh, double our size, uh, but still will be small. And we will be um, ever uh, looking ever further for inspiration from artists and architects, designers, and great thinkers of today. So I would like to leave you now on the dot of uh, half an hour and to say um, how um, marvelous it's been to uh, have the privilege of sharing with you uh, some of the stories, some, I may say, of the stories that... Um, that uh, I've uh, been lucky enough to be involved with over the last 19 years. Thank you very much, Julia. Um, I think I speak on everyone's behalf when we say that was a really inspirational start to the conference, and perhaps we can persuade you to answer questions on the WAMDA website.